How are you doing? I had a question from a follower. It was a really good question, one of the best questions I've had actually. And I said to him, I won't name him because he, he sort of rips in a little bit in his question, but I said, uh, I'll answer it in the next couple of days for you and I'll put it on YouTube. And there was something inside my head that was just telling me to delay it and delay it. And I'm glad I did and I'll tell you why soon. Um, his question was, in your experience, what is it that contributes to some professional NRL players having significantly more basic, basic handling errors than others? And then he names a player, I'm not going to mention it. Is a good young player, but dropped the ball at least three or four times tonight with no one near him on simple chest passes, picking uh, stroke picking the ball up from the ground. Many other Broncos regularly fail to hang on to the ball when given simple passes or being tackled from behind. Are repeated handling errors a case of nerve, sweaty hands, fatigue, or are some guys just worse at handling the ball than others? Keen to know what contributes in your experience. Like I said, there was something that was chipping away at me not to respond, and, and then I went to the Bulldogs uh, game at the Broncos on Saturday. Wow. Talk about a knock on a thon. The first half, honestly, some of the things me and my friends saw, because we're all coaches, so we were analysing it. For example, multiple knock ons. I've not got the statistics in front of me from that game. Um, but there were an awful lot of knock-ons and people were, were genuinely laughing about the state of the game around us. Um, the Broncos, about 20 minutes in, looked really tired. They were struggling to get behind the ball from uh, kick return on tackles two and three. It was real noticeable. The Bulldogs were very robotic. They weren't very robotic at holding the ball, but they tended to try and play robotically. And honestly... On a 68 metre wide field, they could have reduced it to 48 metres. They were just playing within the lines either side that you see where the numbers are on the 10, the 20, the 30, the 40 metre mark. They, were, they weren't pushing the ball wide at all. Yes, they were going wide, but not as wide as they could do. And they were trying to play through the line all the time. It was really frustrating. So I'm glad I kept this question for now. And I'm going to add some more stats. This isn't a rare thing. Um... I wrote a couple of years ago in the Rugby League Hub, or maybe a year and a half ago, that NRL players tend to average about an error and a half a game, or the worst ones at least, and they tend to have about seven or eight handling errors under their belts by round five. So we're getting close to that. That was in 2019 I wrote that. Um, in 2018, I noticed that some of the more decorated players, again, I won't name them, they had more handling errors than they had games to their name. So if they played 19 games, they had 20 handling errors kind of thing, you know. Um, teams were averaging between 4 and 10 handling errors per match in only the first five games of 2019. And over a full season, the average was between 5.8 and 8 handling errors per match. So this isn't a new thing. The English Super League, after about 10 rounds in the same time frame, between 93 and 102 errors for each team in the competition. And several individuals had 16 or 17 errors to their names already. So I think there's a bigger issue at play here in professional rugby league and in terms of the way we develop our juniors. And I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about coaching. I'm going to talk about the type of practice that they do around passing and catching the football. And the third thing I want to talk about is coaching priorities. Um, the first thing, coaching. Now, I blame nothing else but the type of practice that these people are doing because Let's take some other sports. Soccer, football. If you look at the best teams, their control of the football, of the soccer ball, is almost perfect. They achieve that by doing games, skills constantly in training. I've seen football, stroke soccer, training sessions, and I remember thinking, this was before I went down the games method as a coach, thinking that I wonder when the training is going to start, because it's basically all game-based, rondo-based and all that kind of thing. In a nutshell, when a footballer kicks a ball, it tends to go where he or she wants it to go. 
Let's take another sport where the ball is in the hand less, cricket. There's a correlation between uh, a test match team or a one-day team. Drop catches, there's a correlation between that and how much they focused on it in training that week. It is not a coincidence. And, you know, I'm a massive England cricket fan and they'll, they'll drop some catches in the first test and then they'll their captain will talk about how they focused on it in between tests and the second test, all the catching frailties have been have been corrected. <laughs> catching and passing a football is a bit like something like brushing your teeth. You know, you can't brush your teeth for four weeks of the year and hope that they're going to be all right for the rest of the year. You've got to keep chipping away every day at how you catch and pass that football. And I think this is where our coaching systems get it completely wrong. Again, as a coach, I try and be the exact opposite. I'm massive on grip, pass, catch, carry. So the first thing that I've said there is coaching. I just don't think we do it enough. I don't think we focus on it enough. Um, number two, I said the type of practice. Now, I will talk to you a lot about how you structure your training and I'll talk about a framework and it's on rugbyleadcoach.com.au as well. Isolation, opposition, game. So isolation is catching and passing a ball with nothing in front of you except fresh air. You, the person on your right passes you the ball, you catch it, you pass it to your left and then vice versa, right? That's iso isolation training because there's nothing in front of you. Opposition might be a 3v2 because you've got to catch and pass that ball with defenders that want to come and either tackle you or put pressure on you. That brings in a different set of skills because your human instincts start to kick in. Where is that defender? Is that defender going to hit me? All that kind of thing. And then the third thing, isolation, opposition, game. You've got to go through those phases, in my opinion, isolation, opposition, game, and apply and look at the catch and pass in a game scenario in order to make sure that they can pass and catch well in a game scenario. So ways you can do that, you have small-sided games or even your 13-13 scrimmage. And if people don't catch and pass the ball properly, turn over or start the set again or whatever it may be. And that comes down to also coaching priorities, which is my third thing. You know, I wonder sometimes if coaches talk about so many different things that they forget just to mention the importance of holding the ball. If holding the ball is a priority up there, the chances are the players will eventually deliver it, as long as you ram that message home constantly. So to answer your question, um, I don't think it's coached very well, and I don't think our, ver our players are very good at it. They should be catching the ball 98, 99% of the time. The, of course, when they get in, into collisions, the ball will be uh, attacked. There'll be attempted strips. I understand that. But their grip should be so strong that it's coming out a lot less than it is at the minute. And also part of that is the quality of the pass as well. And I'm sorry, my perception is that at the NRL, the Super League, but at all the levels of the game, we simply do not practice it enough. As a coach, I try and do the opposite. I preach that on rugbyleadcoach.com.au, on the Aim Higher programmes and all that kind of thing. Grip, pass, catch, carry is the absolute epicentre of what you do. Um, and once you can do that very well as a player, the whole game opens up to you as well. Um, we've got a bit of a lockdown thing here in Brisbane at the minute. So um, I'm not going to talk about the Aim Higher programme coming up or anything like that just yet. Let's, let's just see what goes on. Um, but it is happening in the second week of the school holidays, Monday the 12th of April. Uh, I hope you're well. Uh, I had a bit of a look at Super League as well, but... Not very much. I watched about 10 minutes. Everyone have a look at Super League this week and look how the markers never get square. It really bugs me. The referees don't penalise them. Now, I heard somebody say that there might be a rule that they allow the player to be on the wrong side. So if the ball's going that way, the, the marker can be there. Well, what's the point of doing that? It's just stupid. So, have a look. Markers are very rarely square. Look, oh. 60-70% of the time, it really bugs me. If you're in Brisbane, stay safe during lockdown. If you're in the UK and things are getting better, um, may they continue to get better and I hope you're enjoying your training runs this week and wherever you may be enjoying your rugby league at the minute, stay safe, enjoy it and, and let's, uh, let's keep analysing it. Cheers.